Welcome to the Rise Method podcast, where we make fitness information available to everyone. I'm Steve. Let's jump in. What's up, guys? Coach Steve here, and welcome back to another episode of the Rise Method podcast. In today's episode, we have three questions that we are going to answer, so let's jump right into it and waste no time. So the first question here comes from a Rise Method member, and they were asking me a question about how many calories are in scotch fillet. <laughs> so they asked me a question, how many calories in scotch fillet? And they had a problem. And the problem was that they were looking at my fitness pal and my fitness pal said that it had 225 calories per 170 grams because that was the the size of the scotch fillet that they wanted to have whereas the rise method app said that it had 388 calories for the 120 uh the 170 grams of the scotch fillet so of course, that's a big discrepancy. You know, that's, that's, that's 150 calories uh, that, that is difference between the two different apps. And I think this really highlights the problem with counting calories and, and tracking calories. So we're not going to dive into how many calories are in the actual beef, the, the scotch fillet itself. Um, you probably find that most data points would be closer to that uh, 388 grams for that uh, calories for the 170 grams of the scotch fillet, but this explanation isn't meant to be talking about how many calories are in the grams of this. What we're going to do is we're just going to zoom out a little bit and and, and see how we can solve this problem, because this problem that is highlighted in the way that we're tracking our calories is also the same problem in the way that we um, track our performance in the gym, how we track our progress outside of the gym, um, how we track our body weight changes, and how we use tools um, to, to measure our progress, okay? And this is this idea of um, precision versus accuracy. So, you know, we could be less precise, um, but be more accurate in ways. So precision might be, you know, hitting a target con- consistently, and accuracy might be uh, hitting the target that we actually want to hit, right? So uh, to understand this, I want to explain a quick story. So about 10 years ago, um, I was 21 and I was invited to a 21st birthday where we went paintballing. So it was for my buddy, Jason. So hi, Jason, how you doing? And we went paintballing. Um, and this was my first time going paintballing, right? Uh, you know, here in Australia, we don't really um, shoot shoot guns or rifles or anything like that. So the first time kind of using a tool like this, okay? Now, what I quickly learned was that the barrels of the paintball apparatus gun needed to be cleaned um, or the actual paintballs could misfire. So what happens was um, inside the barrel, there could be dirt or paint or, or some other thing happening inside the barrel, moments to be bent or curved, um, that could cause the paintball to do wacky things. So here we are in the field. Um, we're about an hour in and I see my buddy Jason lined up um, for a perfect shot. And, uh, you know, he doesn't notice me, I notice him, and I'm like, great, cool, this is the perfect chance, and I'm going to give him a great 21st birthday kiss for this paintball, hitting him right, um, trying to get him right in the square in the, the, the chest, or uh, maybe into the, the helmet. And what I did was I took that shot, and I watched that paintball bend to the left. Okay, so I took that shot, watched that paintball bend to the left. Great, so I missed him. I took another shot, bent to the left, took another shot, bent to the left. And I was there. Noticing that my opportunity to give him that 21st birthday present that I wanted to give him was starting to tick away. Uh, so what I did was I just turned my rifle to the right slightly, um, factoring in that curve, uh, that, that hook to the left, um, and took that shot, nailed him, gave him that 21st birthday kiss, paintball right in the face while well, into the helmet. Uh, it was a great day. Okay. Now, what this highlights is that we can use tools uh, or databases that have a low um, precision, right? Where we want to be aiming for a certain target and when we shoot, it, 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 it misses the target. But we can adjust that error and modify it, tweak it so that we can continue to make progress and hit the target. So when it comes to tracking calories, we need to appreciate that Lots of databases will present different information. So you look at places like MyFitnessPal, Rise Method app, um, other databases, there'll be a difference. Even the way that it's um, cooked. So if you were cooking that scotch fillet, measuring the weight raw versus the measuring the weight cooked, how long did you cook it for? Did you add other things to it? Was the um, actual beef, did it have more fluid than other t- uh, cuts of beef? So that changes the, um, the cooking versus raw versus weight, right? So it's a bit of a mess. 
Then there's other factors that you need to consider, right? So um, how much of that did you actually eat? Did you cut off any gristle? Did you digest all of that? All these types of questions. So there's a chance that how the database that you use is incorrect, how you measure the actual weight is incorrect, and then how you actually absorb that food is incorrect. So it's an error on top of error on top of error. So now your paintball is just flinging left and right and left and right, so it's a mess. But how do we make this more accurate so that we can be more precise? Well, this is where more consistency becomes powerful. So imagine like you have this paintball and you, instead of being able to just shoot it once, you were able to shoot it 10, 20 times. You can then make better adjustments to the, uh, the target so that you can actually hit your target. So you can start to change where you are aiming slightly to the right so that you can factor in that left hook so that you can hit your target. So we can apply this when we are trying to track calories. And the best way to do this is that we are repeating meals consistently, repeating the types of foods that we have consistently and repeating how we measure those foods in a consistent manner. So it doesn't matter really if you choose to measure your food raw versus cooked, or if you choose to use a, a MyFitnessPal database um, or uh, uh, the RISE method database or any other types of measuring um, frameworks like, you know, like a, a palm of your hand or one serving or whatever it decides to be. Whatever you choose to do, as long as you're consistent, then you create a good foundation um, that you can consistently say that, hey, I'm consuming X, right? And you're using algebra for a better sense of, of the word. Um, you know, I'm consuming X, regardless of what the number actually is, I'm consuming X. Then what you could do is monitor that compared to, let's say, your weight loss, right? And if you are losing weight, great, keep eating X, whatever it is, as long as you're consistently having that. So let's say you're having the same types of meals, and most of us would probably have the same, you know, five to 10 dinners on repeat, or maybe, you know, the same one or two breakfasts on repeat, or the same couple of lunches on repeat. The easiest way to lose weight is just to have the same types of meals. So you're consuming X, whatever it is, X calories, X number of meals, X number of scotch fillets, whatever it is. Then if you are losing weight, great, keep doing your thing. If not, just reduce the portion size slightly. So that slight reduction in portion size is the same as just moving the barrel slightly to the right. So just make that slight tweak so you can keep hitting your target. Now, we see these problems in things like measuring tools. So take, you know, body weight scales as an example. So if you went and stood on the scales that I have in my bathroom, and then I went and stood on the scales that you have in your bathroom, and we went to a bunch of other people's houses and stood on different scales and went to the scale at our gym and stood on an in-body scanner that went and did a DEXA scan, I'm sure that our body weight would change between all those different measuring tools, right? So there's slight variance, right? Slight, slight differences in calibration. Um, there may be even the environmental factors, maybe the... Um, Actual scale is on, um, you know, carpet versus tiles versus other things, right? So these inaccuracies are the ways that the barrel is slightly bent or maybe a bit of dirt in the barrels. Each one of our barrels is slightly different, but that doesn't matter because whatever that number is, it might as well just be an abstract number, call it X, right? So even if it is off on your scale versus my scale, that number doesn't have any context or meaning to you, but the difference in those, that number over time is more helpful. So in a better way to say it, if I stand on my scales one day, it's 100 kilos, I stand on your scale, it's 101 kilos, that doesn't mean I gain a kilo, that's, that's meaningless. But on my scales, if I go from 100 kilos to 99 kilos to 98 kilos, then that change is what's important. That X minus one, that, that slight adjustment so I can keep hitting my target is what's important. So Think about this problem that this RISE method member asked, which was, you know, how many calories does Scotch Fillet have? Um, and zoom out for it and say, okay, how do we solve the problem of inaccuracies in the data that we use or the measuring tools that we use? And this could be applied to, uh, you know, almost everything. Let's say, let's say you're at a, a particular gym and you're uh, doing a, a leg press, and we all know that different leg presses have different inclinations, and the sled weighs different amounts, and even the plates might be slightly different. If you went to one gym and you're able to leg press 300 kilos, and then another gym you're able to leg press only 200 kilos, um, that doesn't mean that you've now 30% weaker. That doesn't make sense, right? But if you consistently use the same kit, like the same leg press, same style, and progress that over time, then you can be confident that your legs are growing because on that particular kit, regardless of you know how much weight you're using, because that weight might as well be X, 
you're improving with that apparatus over time, which is what matters the most, okay? So consistency over time, the law of large numbers, you know, large data sets is what can help us over time because uh, ideally we wanna see, you know, kind of trends in data um, and not get caught up in individual numbers over time. Good question. Next question here is how important is it to meet my macro goals? Can I just follow calories? And this is a pretty, pretty quick answer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can just follow a calorie goal um, and see some really great weight loss outcomes. So when we look at weight loss, uh, it really is a, a simple equation of consuming less or fewer calories than we expect, right? And we wanna be in a position where we could tip the scales. Now, going back to the first question, the amount of calories you consume, the actual number of those calories is probably incorrect. You saying that I am consuming 2000 calories, that's probably incorrect. That number isn't probably accurate. You know, you might've weighed that food differently, you absorbed it differently, the data that you got it from is different, but that number, it doesn't matter. That number might as well be X, okay? But within the calorie constraint model, we wanna be consuming, you know, uh, a consistent number of, of calories. So it could be X, it could be that I'm consuming the same number of these types of meals over time. But as long as we're hitting that energy intake number, then we can start to quantify one side of that equation and then quantify the other side of the equation and we could measure our energy expenditure, probably the best way is through our step count. Um, because again, activity trackers can be wildly inaccurate, but you know, it could give us a bit of a guide. So it's not fair to say that you consume 2000 calories and then your smartwatch says that you expend 2000 calories. Those two numbers are probably wrong. But over time, you might look at that energy expenditure and you say, hey, I used to expend 2000 calories a day. Now it's down to 1500 calories a day scratch your head, why is that happening? So even though that number might not be true, you might be expending more or less than that, but that data is consistently incorrect, but it gives you a trend that your overall energy expenditure might be decreasing over time. So you might need to find ways to increase that number on a smartwatch or increase your step count. That's probably how you can manipulate that number the best way. So when it comes to losing weight, yeah, you don't need to stress over macros that much. You know, we can just follow a calorie intake. And this is what I recommend to most folks who are just starting out. Instead of making a really complicated, complex method to lose weight, start simple, start really simple. Start with just calories, just measure calories. Don't worry about proteins, fats, carbs, uh, fiber, micronutrients, or anything like that. Just start with calories and it makes it really easy for us just to track number one, one number, manipulate that number so we can make a progress over time. So when it does come to macros, let's say you're in that position where you go, hey, yeah, I actually want to uh, consider macros. I want to track macros. I want to, to put effort into knowing these numbers. Yeah, you totally can. And it might in a way make the calorie intake um, a little bit easier because instead of tracking just one number, we can kind of break it down into smaller portions. So you have maybe three micro goals rather than one macro goal might, might be easier for you. Now, when it comes to tracking macros, the most important one has to be protein. Number one has to be protein. Uh, and that is because um, protein plays a major part in building muscle, maintaining muscle. Um, and then for many of us who are just having a, a standard um, you know, Australian diet, we, we, we tend to have lower protein intake. So it's wise just to kind of track this number so that we can make sure that we're kind of meeting a baseline. Now, big question, how much protein do I need? Well, data says anywhere between you know 1.6 to 2.4 is, is kind of a good range um, where the progress uh, the benefits of more protein kind of plateau around this time. So, you know, about 1.5, 1.6, you know, we get good um, benefits of having that protein, a little bit more, kind of a little bit a little bit more benefit. So you kind of see a flattening of that, that benefit. Um, and then you see a very gentle uh, benefit of more protein over time, upwards to about three grams per kilo of body weight. But the problem then is that having higher protein intakes have side effects, like you feel bloated, um, bit, a bit of flatulence or, or you know gas kind of occurring, you might feel cramping in the stomach, these types of things. Um, so it also uh, takes away from other macronutrients like let's say carbohydrate and fat intake, right? So for most of us, a, a good target to aim for, a simple target to aim for 
is just two grams per kilo of body weight. So that is the halfway point between maybe like 1.6, 2.4, two kilos, great, easy maths. Let's say me, about 100 kilos, two times 100, 200 grams, great, that's my protein target for the day. You might then choose to uh, look at it as serves of protein. So let's say you aim to have serves of protein about uh, 30 to 40 grams of protein. So that might equate to 120, 150 grams of, of cooked chicken, right, as, as a serve. So you might see that 200 gram goal as, let's say, six or seven serves of protein. So if I was having, um, let's say, three, maybe four meals a day, I might choose to have, you know, one or two serves of protein with each meal so that I can kind of like like Lego build my meals up so that I can reach my goal. That might be one way. Or I just track everything I eat in a, in a calorie counting app, like the Rise Method app, uh, and then you could see that number slowly climb over time. Now, this can be a really great way to, if you wanted to just log your food to track your calories, you can start to see what um, macros make up the food compositions. So you might find, hey, you know, having um, Nutri-Grain in the morning that's marketed as, you know, uh, fitness food, has quite a low protein intake. Okay, well, there's, there's a bit of a problem. How could I add a protein to this? Maybe I'll add a protein powder to increase the overall protein intake into this, this food. Once we worked out our protein, it's best to try to convert that back into calories. So let's say my target was, for argument's sake, 2,000 calories, uh, and my protein intake was 200 grams of protein, for argument's sake. Um, I would convert, convert that 200 grams into 800 calories, times that by four, then looking at my goal, 2000 calories, I minus my protein intake, so that's 800 calories. So now I have 1200 calories left. Easy way would just be to split that in two between our um, carbs and fats, or you could work out your minimum fat intake. So minimum is probably around like 1.6, 1.8 grams of fat per kilo of body weight. An easy way would be to work out it closer to one. So let's say one gram of fat per kilo of body weight, about 100. So I want about 100 grams of fats for the day, times that by nine, 900 calories. So, so far we've got 800 calories going to proteins, 900 calories to fat, so that makes 1700 calories. So the 300 remaining calories would go to our carbohydrate. So that can be quite low in carbohydrate, maybe 80 grams of carbs for the day, um, but that would be a way that you might work out a macro split. An easier way might be just to um, split your macros evenly, you know, 35, 35, 40 or something like that, 40, 30, 30, um, just to simplify our macro intake. But these are ways that we just kind of complicate nutrition and might make it easier for some folk. Um, but for many of us, you know, going from calories deeper into macros only offers maybe a few percentage points and that could be just to meet our protein intakes uh, because there isn't a really big difference between um, our ratios of carbs to fats when it comes to weight loss because all it is is calories that is the the big uh, trump card of on on our weight loss endeavors and it really is just a preference between our calories and our fat intake right the last question here is a little bit longer it goes i train at 8 p.m and i usually take a pre-workout after work I don't know if it's because of the session or the pre-workout, but I find it hard to get to sleep. Is there anything I can do? Okay, let's break it down. So it sounds like this individual um, is, is working full time. They, they come home, maybe they have a dinner um, and then they're maybe low in energy. They, they're taking something like a pre-workout to, to build them up. They go and train, they do their session. And when they get home, so if they're starting at eight, maybe an hour, 9, 9.30, 10 or so, um, they're finding it hard to, to get to sleep. And that's fair enough. So a few things that we can consider. One, of course, um, you know, how tired are you after work? Two, um, the effects of caffeine in that pre-workout. And then three, the effects of training on, on our sleep, okay? So um, the, the, the big rock here is that you need to appreciate that caffeine um, is probably keeping you awake at night. <laughs> um, so caffeine has what's called a half-life of six hours for most folks on average, which, which, which means that if you had a pre-workout at, at 8 p.m., that six hours later, half of that pre-workout caffeine is still active in your bloodstream. So if you had a standard serving of pre-workout, let's say 200 milligrams of caffeine at, uh, what is it, 2 a.m., six hours later, 100 milligrams is still active floating around your bloodstream going, hey, yo, let's party. So no wonder, um, you know, if you're trying to go to bed at 10, 30, 11 o'clock, there's quite a bit of caffeine still in your bloodstream, 
course, depending on your size, your tolerance, that type of thing, that your brain might be going, hey, yeah, okay, we're, we're, we're ready to party. Now, that half-life can scale depending on individuals. Some folks are as low as maybe an hour, an hour and a half, so we metabolize caffeine quite quickly. Other folks are a little bit longer, you know, maybe closer to eight, nine hours or so where our caffeine is still active in our body. So if you compound other things, like let's say you have an afternoon coffee and then you have a pre-workout, you might have a lot of caffeine kind of floating around your, your bloodstream. So when you do go to sleep, that caffeine is still active. Now, some folks, of course, would say, hey, you know, Steve, I have a, ca- I have a, a coffee before I go to bed. Uh, we've been doing it for years, no, no dramas. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you probably have no issues going to sleep. Maybe genetically you have a lower half-life or maybe you can get to sleep, but your brain still is really active when you go to sleep. And what we tend to see is that folks that choose to have a, a coffee before they go to bed also um, report feeling you know groggy in the morning and stuff even though they've been sleeping for eight you know ten hours or so but their brain would be really active their body was really active maybe they're um, in and out of sleep throughout the night maybe they suffer things like sleep apnea and such because of how active they are um, mentally with the caffeine stimulating them while they're while they're sleeping so um, there might be uh, some problems and, and if this is you I would recommend um, trialing a period where you abstain from caffeine before you go to bed and see if there's any improvements in your sleep. So the easy answer is to not take the, the pre-workout, right? That could help um, getting to sleep afterwards. But we also face the problem of, well, you're not as stimulated when you're going to train. Okay. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we need to appreciate that during the day, we're going to get tired, right? We've been at work all day. You're probably making decisions at work and the decision fatigue is fatiguing. We only have a finite amount of you know decisions we can make. And of course, in the day, you're exhausted. You need a, a pick-me-up. So Is there ways that you could reduce the amount of um, stress it takes to do the day? So that could be to simplify your life, like uh, uh, wear the same clothes so you don't have to decide what clothes you have to wear, simplify your food so you don't have to choose what you're going to eat, maybe simplify your work routines that you're doing, set meetings, set routines, set activities so that your decision fatigue decreases, that at the end of the day, you might have a bit more energy to go and train. That's one option. You might not be able to influence that. Maybe you can, okay? Next, we could utilize other sports supplements to help us get through. One popular category of sports supplements that's really taking off right now is the non-stim or low-stim um, pre workout So you could go to a retailer and, and have a look at some of their range. I personally never tried um, a, a no-stim, um, but you might have success in something like that. I think that the budget version of a, a low stim pre-workout would be just to have some sort of tasty drink like a like a Gatorade or something similar like that. So you have a little bit of something sweet, you know, something like, like the, the workout juice, right? Um, and then you maybe add in some sort of compound, um, maybe like a, a creatine. Now creatine doesn't work as a pre-workout, but adding that in just adds in that you're actually taking a creatine supplements, right? So you can uh, saturate that over time. And then add in some other hydration tool uh, so most pre-workouts would have some elements of um, sodium in it and also within something like Gatorade, they would have some elements of sodium as like electrolyte, but adding a pinch of sodium, like a bit of salt into that can help with hydration. So at the end of the day, um, if you're going to go train, you've got something you know sweet that you can drink. Um, maybe a little bit of um, electrolyte in there, a bit of salt in there just to help with hydration so that you're ticking all the boxes to help you to get into the gym and have a a great session. You can look at other ways to hype you up, let's say um, um, music or environment or a training partner to try to get you excited to train later in the evening. Of course, there's a big question mark of could you train at a different time of the day? Like let's say first thing in the morning. So you flip your routine, it might take a bit of time to adjust where instead of training in the evening, you choose to go to bed early um, and then you train in the morning. That could be a way that you could utilize a pre-workout if you like to have that supplement um, so that you can get a good session in. Finally, we need to appreciate that if you are working out late in the evening, you know, you are kind of hyping yourself up, you know, very, uh, uh, lizard brain you know you've just done a you've just done a workout lifted weight your blood rushing your your heart's pumping like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right then um when you go home you need to kind of like wind down and your your body to kind of switch from this kind of like adrenaline fight or flight like yeah, i'm just gonna work out to all right time to sleep so that can take some time so i hope that when you get home you maybe have a shower you wind down chill out relax kind of cool down a little bit like physically cool down go somewhere cold um so that you can actually get to sleep and that could take time so Regardless of what's happening with uh, any pre-workout or caffeine, it might be that once you get home, 
you're within 10 minutes trying to get to sleep. Uh, and of course, you just need to phys- physically cool down, calm down and, and relax so that you can actually get to bed. Right. But interesting questions all around. But team, let's wrap it up there. Today, we spoke about uh, calories in a scotch fillet, but we didn't really speak about that. We kind of zoomed out and talking about inaccuracies in data. We talked about calories versus macros, what you could follow to lose weight, uh, and then talking about training in the evening and struggling to get to sleep. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Rise Method podcast, and we'll catch you next week for the next one. See you guys.